Hey, good evening, everyone. I'd like to call to order this committee of the whole meeting of the Council of the Town of Saugeen Shores and welcome everybody to the uh, Council Chambers this evening. Uh, the uh, second item is, is disclosures of pecuniary interest, and I'll ask any member if they have one of those they'd like to declare. Councillor Carr. Uh, yeah, I need to declare uh, pecuniary interest with uh, item 9-1 in regards to the concession 6 employment land as I could be a future purchaser. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Smith. Yes, I'd like to declare a pecuniary interest related to item 7.2, the waterfront revitalization project, as my husband, Ryan Smith, is a part owner of the Social Athletics of Saugeen Shores. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other declarations? I don't see any. So that moves us on to additions and deletions and amendments. We don't have any of those. And that moves us then on to open forum. And there is one request for an open forum from John Mann with regard to the waterfront lease agreement. But uh, Mr. Mann spoke to council on September 9th on that issue. And so therefore his delegation will not be heard due to the open, due to the six month rule. Speak on this topic. You did on the waterfront. Well, then I on the CCV. The to Thank wave. you very much. Your, your delegation will not be heard uh, because yes, it's a uh, the council to wave. How Mr. Mann, Mr. Mann, Mr. Mann, Mr. Mann, your delegation, your, your open forum is out of order. Please take a seat. Thank you. It's an open forum and it's out of order. Well, it's out of order. You're hearing it from me. I'm the chairman of the committee and I'm saying that your, dele your open forum is out of order. Please take a seat. Thank you, Mr. Mann. Mr. Mann, if you... I'm if criticizing you, counsel. Mr. Mann, if Mr. Mann, if you will not give up the podium, Mr. Mann, Mr. Mann. Mr. Mann, give up the podium, please. Mr. Mann, take a seat. No, Mr. Mann. Okay, council will take a recess until Mr. Mann uh, takes his seat. I'd like to raise a point of order regarding the procedural bylaw. Yep. To allow an exemption to the six month rule and allow Mr. Mann to voice his opinion here tonight. Certainly you can, and we would subject that to a vote. Uh, so I would, uh, based on uh, the councillor's point of order, I would ask all in favor then of hearing Mr. Mann's uh, open forum presentation this evening. Opposed? That's carried. Mr. Mann, you have three minutes. Believe it or not, uh, all we want to do is be meaningfully included and meaningfully participate in the main beach lease. We want, all want to be proud of it. It's legendary. We all live here. I've been going here for 68 years, my all, all 68 years. I'm proud of it. I'm, it's legendary. So all we want to do is be meaningfully included, meaningfully participate, and we're left out. You don't have to agree with anybody, but we got to be meaningfully included. You got to say why you don't. Two weeks ago, February 10, approved the lease. Two weeks later, 10 sections of that lease, Mr. Smith says, we're going to change. And staff's going to control the lease for the next 50 years and take the uh, council out of it. Don't give up your fiduciary duty to protect our interests. You, you uh, serve our best interests. We're citizens. Don't give it to staff. We don't elect staff. We elect you to do the decisions. Nobody debates anything here. Treat us like dirt, frankly. I can't say enough bad things about this council in mayor, the way you treat us. Uh, and after careful consideration, this lease is being amended. The very next meeting on, on 10 points? Boy, it sounded like that was a well-thought-out lease. And I know something about leases. I went to the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeal on a lease once. This is outrageous how, what's going on here. But nothing will happen. You, you won't listen to us because you can get away with it. You don't care. That's what you're, the message you're sending. Why aren't our uh, ideas good? 
Why don't you discuss them? Why don't you debate them? Why don't you tell us why they're good or not good? Why are you giving it all to the staff to do, which is actually Mr. Smith, who frightened my, my bride when, when we stopped here one time? Judy Ashby, unbelievable the way he treated us. A sad day for this town. Sad day to be treated like this. All we want is to be proud of our main beach, be part of it. Hey, we were part of that. Instead, we're left out. You divided the place, and there's no reason. No, none whatsoever. Why can't we participate in this? And then you just look at me, and no, no one talks to me. I'm in here, I feel unwanted. Yeah, big deal, right? Right? No one cares? I don't know another place that I've been that uh, treats people like this. That's three minutes, Mr. Mann. Thank you. The only thing you're good That's at three is minutes, keeping Mr. Mann. time. Thank three you, Mr. Mann. Thank you. Gone. Thank you, Mr. Mann. I, that I can't moves say us on things. to Thank delegations. You. And we have two delegations this evening. The first one is from Laura Robinson and the second one from Bruce Walls. Just remind both of our uh, delegations that, of course, our delegations are 10 minutes in length. And, uh, and uh, we certainly appreciate uh, hearing closely to that timeline. So, uh, Ms. Robinson. The button on your on your microphone. There. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm uh, speaking on financial accountability and transparency this evening. So good evening, Mayor Charbonneau and Councillors. Um, after reviewing a number of presentations to Council by the County, by Town staff, by not-for-profits, such as the Victorian Order of Nurses and the Women's House in Concarden, it appears that there are a number of innovations that are overdue for this municipality. Meanwhile, New municipal, the new Municipal Innovation Council has made the following priorities. Construction and infrastructure, municipal sustainability, and livable communities. The MIC's other focus, IT and digital solutions, can help shed some sunlight on how financial decisions are made and prioritized. This should be done in a clear and concise manner that breaks down and gives a rationalization for costs. In other words, as the MIC takes shape, we need to know how it will address some of these issues and crises that Sogging Shores now face. So, what will the MIC measure to ensure it addresses livable communities and municipal sustainability? Will it address the affordable housing crisis? I... Um, looked online and found that uh, on September 19th, uh, September 30th, 2019, Bruce County gave you a graph of the housing wait list for community housing. And Sogging Shores is up to nearly 350 units being waited for, uh, much higher than any other area in Bruce County. So how are we going to use the MIC to address that? Um, will the MIC address solutions to the March 25th, 2019 report, so almost almost a year ago, from the Victorian Order of Nurses when it was announced that there's only one pra nurse practitioner serving more than 600 patients and two retirement homes in Saugeen Shores? Um, I know I checked online and uh, we I could see that about a couple weeks ago that a position has gone uh, been posted to be filled, but it's not a full-time position. Um, and how are we measuring what the needs are and how successful we are at answering those needs, whether it's affordable housing or uh, health care? Um, so for organizations that purport to believe in the scientific method, the MOU um, that Sogeen Shorts has signed with the Nuclear Innovation Institute in terms of the MOU, in terms of the MIC rather, contains what I would call doublespeak. For instance, participate in conversation with invited resources, coordinate and secure partnerships for the Municipal Innovation Council. Well, what partnerships will be coordinated and secured and who will be invited to be partners? And the MOU continues, ensuring local communities are informed and invited to join. Well, invited has been used twice in this um, MOU. So, for instance, does a community, a local community, also include Saugeen Ojibwe Nation? 
Um, they just rejected the, the uh, burial of nuclear waste in their territory. Um, does the MIC formerly include SON as a local community? And if so, why are they not, if they're not um, included as a local community, why not? Why, how are we defining local communities and how are we inviting people to our Municipal Innovation Council? Um, and, and how are Soggy, the citizens of Soggy and Shores able to know when there are meetings of the MIC and are they open to us? After all, we're funding them. Will our voices be accurately reflected in MIC reports? If Indigenous communities are not considered local communities, then I would like to know exactly how, you, how the MIC will measure um, a community response. Um, if these meetings take place in the kind of secretive way that the countless county meetings have concerning the Nuclear Innovation Institute, then no one in Soggy Shores should support them. When our money is being spent, we need transparency, accountability, and communication because community members have the right to give input and be fully aware of decisions made on our behalf. So the MOU on the MIC continues, quote, be responsible for budget including reporting to MIC partners. So let's look now at being responsible for budgets as I believe this is a very important point, place for transparency and accountability. Uh, so I have some questions. So last year from February 27th to March 1st, 29, Mar Mayor Charbonneau, CAO David Smith and Director of Strategic Initiatives uh, J Jessica Linthorne, who is now the chair of the MIC, attended the Canadian Nuclear Association's annual conference in Ottawa. Mayor Charbonneau reported on this in March 2019, so I'm not going to read verbatim his report to you. I, it's in my presentation to council and you can read it and you can read his full report. Um, but there appears to be nothing that I could see that could not have been accomplished either in meetings or phone calls in Sogging Shores. And I'd be interested in having Mayor Charbonneau give particular information to the contrary. So let's look at the cost of attending the conference. Assuming the mayor and staff received the members early bird rate and because Bruce County now pays an annual $5,000 fee to be a member of the Canadian Nuclear Association, let's just say they also got the member's discount. Still, the discounted cost simply to attend is $850 each. So $2,550 for three, which is $50 more than the $2,500 council pledged to give Women's House in Concarden for the entire year. And by the way, I called Women's House last week and they have not received their donation yet as of last week if the town does plan on giving one. But if you go back to that presentation that was made here in January, they served 783 women, 194 children and fielded 8,602 crisis support and advocacy phone calls. These facts are, are very easily uh, accessed on, on their uh, presentation to you. They still have to raise $193,592 this year just to close the gap between the emergency services they provide and the paltry amount various levels of government fund them. How will the MIC address this? Will the director of the MIC be attending the AGMs of Women's Shelters of Canada? Back to the nuclear conference though. Accommodation rates are at minimum $200 a night looking at what their, the CNA was advertising for this year's conference, that's before taxes. So for two rooms over two nights, that the cost is over $1,000. Three rooms would be over $1,500. That doesn't include transportation and meals for three. I'm not saying the mayor and staff should not attend conferences, of course not. But when they do, we need to know how the costs were rationalized and prioritized. We do need to know that the, um, we need to know that the cost for attending the CNA conference is more than twice as much as this council gave to Women's House for the entire year. And I, I'm not going to show the shots of uh, the promo from last year's, but definitely we saw in that uh, promo the, you know, adult magic night Mardi Gras. 
um, that all three were at. So there are, um, the, I, I'm going back to your report, Mayor Charbonneau, from the CNA 2019, and you also reported that you met with a number of federal officials, and so did the CAO and the Director of Strategic Initiatives, to discuss potential solutions to the labour shortage issue that is affecting communities across Canada, including Sogging Shores. In particular, we, we discussed opportunities to address the issue in the short term through enhanced immigration programs. And those are laudable goals because skilled labor does appear to be in short supply. And this area's economy is dependent upon it. Everyone knows that. And that includes nurse practitioners. And I would be interested in knowing if the above three representatives discussed nursing with federal officials the way they did nuclear energy with federal officials. And I'd also want to revisit what the Women's House told you in January, because uh, you are talking about labor in, or you were talking about labor last year in your uh, discussions uh, with federal officials, according to the mayor's report. But an American study that interviewed 8,000 women in 2005 reported that on average, a woman who experiences violence lost 7.2 work days of productivity and 33.9 days of lost productivity in other areas. So again, how are we prioritizing where we're going and who we're meeting with and why we're meeting with them? And going back to the nurses, the Nursing Best Practice Guideline for Registered Nurses in Ontario from 2005 shows, quote, that between 17 and 30 percent of all women treated in emergency departments are victims of domestic violence. So when we're talking about our health care, we're talking also about how are we addressing violence against women. And that might be a very important priority for council to have. So again, what are we measuring and how are we measuring it? Um, just imagine reducing our We're just our coming up on 11 care. minutes there, Ms. Robinson. So okay. if you could wrap it up, please. Thank you. I, I just I, have, could I, I just do the last I just, paragraph? I didn't mean to stop you dead, just if oh. you, could just, you could wrap it up. And, yes. Um, uh, the MIC, I hope, will address homelessness and the affording, affordable housing crisis. Understanding the urgent need for public transportation and its relationship to affordable housing and understand how the connectivity of all these things make communities truly livable and sustainable and as someone who has researched and written about violence against women and children for many decades, I would like to be part of that. Uh, but for now, a transparent accounting of every cent that has been spent on attending conferences and meetings to advance the Nuclear Innovation Institute and the Municipal Innovation Council, including the Canadian Nuclear Association, which I believe happens at the end of this week, um, would be a good place to start. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there uh, questions or comments? Uh, Councillor Smith. Yes, Laura, I just want to thank you for bringing to our attention, again, uh, an important need in our community. Uh, we did hear from Michelle in January, as you've mentioned, and I just want to reiterate that the Women's House is a non-profit organization that's funded by the provincial, sorry, the province of Ontario's Ministry of Children, Community and Social Services, as well as the Ministry of the Attorney General. Uh, however, as you mentioned, there's approximately $150,000 deficit, or not deficit, rather, delta between the, their, their provincial funding and, and what they require to continue to operate. Uh, it is important to note that per personal financial donations are accepted year-round mm -hmm. uh, from individuals throughout the community. Uh, for as little as $48, individuals can fund a counseling session for a woman or child, as well as for $138, an individual could sponsor a night of safe shelter and counseling and referrals. Uh, in addition to the many sponsorships that they seek, they also host a number of events and in collaboration with the County of Bruce, they are in fact hosting an event next week. Uh, I've attended this event in several times in the past. It's in celebration of International Women's Day. This year it features a speaker highlighting women's participation in the trades, particular to the labour issue that you spoke about. And I hope that a number of members of this community and perhaps some of you in this room will take the time to attend that valuable fundraiser for the Women's Shelter next week. I'd uh, just Thank like you. if I could respond. Just very briefly. It wasn't a question there, so. Okay. Uh, it, uh, I don't believe it was 150. I believe it was 193,000 that they have to make up. 
uh, between the various levels of government funding. But And I also think that, and I'm a fundraiser, so I know all about how much work that takes. I, I do believe that uh, taxpayers would want to contribute more than 2500 to the town. Okay, Councillor Grace. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Laura, it uh, just so happened that uh, as we'll go on with our budget discussion at a later point in the meeting, um, that I'm going to be I'm going to be doing a motion um, asking for um, extra funding that we found to be available to certain groups that have requested um, some funding that wasn't able to be accommodated in the regular tax levy. So what I Dis discovered, and it's in the report, the budget report before us tonight, is that um, the town of Saugeen Shores has donated, um, has waived property taxes uh, for the Port Elgin site since 2009. Um, this year's was over $3,000, so I don't know, maybe somewhere in the low 30000 amount. Mm -hmm. We donated the land for the original build, which would have been a minimum of $50,000, and the development charges at the time, which was 9300 So that's also a donation, uh, which is ongoing and has been ongoing since uh, the Port Elgin site was established. I'm not trying to say that people shouldn't be fundraising and spending more money, but I just thought the public would be interested in knowing that uh, the town has found other ways to support the Women's House of Green Bruce. I, I'd like to respond to that, if I could, uh, because I, I have been researching, not here, but in other places, what uh, municipalities waive in terms of taxes, and it seems to me that um, property taxes are waived, uh, at least in British Columbia, for churches. So uh, there is already an established pattern of waiving for what we might call not-for-profits, uh, and, uh, and I think these are all good things. Um, but I also would still say that, as we know from the December 6th uh, uh, memorial, uh, that one, th w the one uh, element of crime that has never decreased in our area is violence against women. Anything further? Councillor Schreider. Um, thank you, and through you. Uh, thank you, Laura, very much. I think that uh, even in your first paragraph, you had pointed out that a number of innovations that are overdue for our municipality, um, it really confirms for me the need for the collaborative working group like the MIC. Um, so I thank you for providing more topics that they will be able to tackle. Um, I believe that the MIC was a concept that was developed around the table of Bruce County CAOs. Um, I do not believe the intent is to exclude any municipalities or communities. Um, it was intended to develop the program, stretch its legs, uh, get it functioning, and then explore other partnerships. Uh, the MIC was launched one, about a month ago, uh, just a little over a month ago, and already very popular with other municipalities, communities, and members of the public like yourself. Um, the four priorities that were developed were actually um, thought up through uh, per prioritization exercise with the participating municipalities. So it wasn't specifically to sh Saugeen Shores needs. It was the, uh, the municipalities that, that contributed towards that. Um, I believe that there are other topics as well, uh, emerging issues that did not make the top four. Um, doctor recruitment or orphan patients in communities, much like Saugeen Shores, I believe was one of those topics. Um, so it does not mean that those topics aren't important um, and that they won't be dealt with in a timely manner, it's just that those weren't the top four that were prioritized during that exercise through the through the MIC. Um, I support the MIC. Uh, I support the communities and municipalities that are involved and the staff that have developed the MIC. Um, they have built a program that will succeed and it will assist our municipalities and the other communities that are involved. Um, with our struggles that we all face and also highlight our successes that we can share our successes with and hopefully others can, can learn from as well. Um, any questions on budget, uh, I definitely encourage you to attend budget meetings because all of that information is there. There's detailed line item reports for staff and department, professional development, uh, conference training dollars that, that are set aside. Um, so all the spending including conferences, professional development, um, is tracked, it's reported, and are all public documents. Um, attending training sessions and conferences is very beneficial, and uh, you gain much more knowledge 
from the speakers or the handouts or the materials that you receive there, but the real take home is the networking and relationship building that our staff do at these conferences and professional development. Um, if it costs $1,000 or $2,000 for our staff to attend and represent Sogging Shores in the manner that they did, then I would send them again next year without a question. Um, I stated during budget deliberations that I was actually disappointed when not all of our professional development funds were spent um, and I encourage staff to continue to spend those that would, there was a lot of take homes um, with them so that's my, that's my two cents. If thank I could you. thank you Councillor. It's it, really the members of council are just making statements here Ms. Robinson so I, we don't need to have a I lot of back some, and forth. I wouldn't mind correcting things though. Well, at least very briefly, Ms. Robinson. Okay, so it, it wasn't 1,000 to 2,000 to go. And, and, and as I said, I'm not opposed to going to conferences. I think they learn plenty. I, I'd also say that I do have a copy of, of the mayor's report, and, and there were seven con uh, conferences and training. I would just like to know what they were, why, why did, were they prioritized, and did it cost us, and if so, how much? Okay, hey, thank you. Any further comments uh, from Ms. Robinson? I'll be attending the CNA uh, later this week, and uh, council and the community can expect a full report from me on that uh, in March uh, upon my return. Thank you, Ms. Robinson. So uh, that moves us then on to uh, uh, actually not uh, Bruce Wallace. I said that earlier, but it isn't Bruce. It's Delina Williams, and she's here to talk to us uh, about the Nuclear Innovation Institute. Ms. Williams. Thank um, Thank you. Um, so my name is Selena Williams and I'm the Executive Director for the Nuclear Innovation Institute and I've come here today to provide an update on our facility, um, on your facility that we're leasing from you. Um, so I will just get started, maybe. So um, we signed the lease last year and we began renovations in October after the police left the, the space and we've been working with a fantastic contractor, Alan Hastings, and an amazing architect, uh, Grant Demert, who were recommended by the town and who also built the original building. So it's been really great to have them lead in the renovations. Um, that's just a sneak peek of what the inside looked like a few weeks ago. Um, for those that are familiar with the space, um, what we ended up doing was taking out all the offices that, that were currently there. So we have a large open space. A couple of boardrooms were, were using the cells as our offices. We did take out the toilets. We don't need toilets in our offices but um, and then we've also re, uh, renovated the garage or will be so I'll talk a little bit about that um, so we've had no issues or no surprises which is great um, everything's on, on track and on budget um, and the town has been really helpful I met with um, Jane from the town last week to talk about when we do take occupancy how we can kind of work with the town on ongoing kind of management of the facilities so everything's been great and I know it's hard to visualize right now because of what the exterior looks like but our vision is um, or what we plan to do is have it look like um, this we'll be painting the brick we'll be putting new uh, siding along the exterior we have an exterior kind of entrance that we'll be building so we're really excited about kind of refreshing the exterior look um, and we will have, um, we expect that by the end of March, we'll be able to start working out of it. Um, and we'll, we'd love to have everyone come and we'll do an open house and invite people in to come and tour the facility. When it's ready, we have about five staff that will be working out of it regularly, um, in addition to any events, meetings, and things like that that will take place. So this is just a bit of an overview of the layout. Um, as you can see, we kind of have an open kind of entrance and then we have a very large innovation area which will be made up of different types of furniture that can be reconfigured depending on the teams and what's happening. We have a couple of private boardrooms which we can use for meetings. Um, and then we have the area on the back which we've not very creatively called the garage um, where we, we can host, where we'd like to do with that space is be a bit of a multi-purpose area where we can bring in different technologies from different companies or different schools to kind of showcase different different technologies ongoing, um, bring in students, hold classes, do after hours activities, things like that to really make it a very kind of open space for the community, community groups and um, founding members and uh, ourselves. And then we also have the office area as well, which I mentioned are the cells just kind of painted with some carpet. This is just a bit of a sneak peek. Um, 
of what the interior could look like, um, just with our architect kind of renderings um, and different types of furniture and just the, the, the idea just to give you a sense of what the space will kind of feel like. We won't have purple doors though. Um, and lastly, um, we are, in, in addition to the space, um, we've refreshed our website. We're starting to really look at kind of what innovation processes might look like and working with the Innovation Council, the Municipal Innovation Council to give them our expertise and our advice and our support to get their teams up and running. Um, we are planning on an annual conference on May 28th, um, which looking forward to sharing more information. It's going to be called Meet Up by the Shore, um, and we'll be hosting it both here and in our space, both here at the Plex and in our space. And one part of it, um, the, the focus of the conference will be really on kind of what nuclear can learn from other sectors or other industries. So we know that there's a lot of great things going on in a lot of different industries, and how can we leverage that knowledge in, in the nuclear industry? Um, we're particularly excited that we'll be hosting a technology launch pad or like um, a trade show where we've invited a number of Ontario colleges and universities to come to the area to bring their technologies, their innovations, their, their um, different things that they're working on to have a bit of a trade show for a number of colleges and universities and we'll have that part open to the public. We'll um, be inviting students to come in and do touring of the different um, of the different technologies. So we're very excited to be able to bring that to the area and we just wanted to kind of thank you all for your support to date and we look forward to inviting you all to come see the space when it's ready. Okay, thank you very much. Questions or comments from members of the committee? I don't see any, so thanks very much for that update, thank Selena. You. I appreciate having that look at your plans. Okay, so that moves us then on to uh, reports of municipal officers and committees and a public notice report. It's a staff report on the 2020 budget, and uh, I guess the treasurer will have the report. The treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Staff of report have prepared a final recommended budget based on the input council gave in the initial operating and capital sessions in November and December. Council's feedback was very valuable in determining the final decisions and direction. Many variables which were not known during the initial budget sessions have now come to light. These key variables include the final school board rates, the proposed county rates, our final 2020 insurance premiums, a clearer understanding of union contract negotiations, and final budgets from a number of other organizations such as BASRA. Changes from the previously presented budgets are highlighted in the report. Staff are extremely pleased that we have been able to incorporate additional council requests and a $750,000 increase to the transfer to the legacy reserve within the council directed 3% blended tax rate increase. This budget maintains service levels, addresses a number of needs, and continues our plan of saving for future upgrades by adding over $2 million to our reserve positions. The municipal tax rate on res residential properties in this budget sits at 0 0.00618494, and the total blended rate sits at 0 0.0117019. That municipal rate applied to the final 2020 assessment roll will raise a total levy of $17,242,562. The year-over-year -year total tax rate increase for a typical residential property in Sogging Shores comes out to $109.07, and there have been no changes in tax ratios for different property classes. Today, staff are seeking the committee's approval of the proposed budget and the proposed tax levy, but work on a number of operating and financial issues continues through the rest of 2020. Many of our community's desires and council's desires for specific plans and projects requires preparation that takes place at all times during the year. Staff will continue to work away at a number of issues that council has brought forward through the budget process. Our long range financial plan, reserve strategy and asset management plans all play a big factor in determining the future infrastructure and services that will drive our community's future funding needs and tax rates. Thank you for receiving the report and I'm happy to take any questions that you have. 
Thanks, Daniel. We'll read the recommendation, and we can take questions or comments from the committee. It's recommended that Council approve the municipal budget for the year 2020 as follows. Expenditures under operating and reserves, $33,269,448. Under capital, $9,410,306 for a total 2020 uh, expenditure of $42,679,754. Uh, under revenues, uh, operating and reserves, $17,666,258. Capital revenues of $7,770,934 for a total 2020 budget for revenues of $25,437,192. And finally, total municipal taxation for operating and reserves of $15,603,190. Capital taxation, $1,639,372 for a total 2020 taxation budget of $17,242,562. That the town of Saugeen Shores tax levy be set, therefore, to seventeen million two hundred forty-two thousand five hundred sixty-two dollars, and that the BIA levies for two thousand twenty be set at thirty-three thousand dollars for the Port Elgin BIA and twenty-nine thousand three hundred fifty dollars for the Southampton BIA, and that the tax levy bylaw establishing the two thousand twenty tax rates be considered by council at a future date. Questions or comments from the committee? Councillor Grace. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm um, referring to the section of your report, Dan, um, that's um, titled Other Considerations, uh, which lists um, requests from three organizations that are not included in the proposed budget as it stands right now. The Saugeen Rail Trail Association, uh, a $5,000 increase to annual grant, which has been requested. The annual grant is 15000 at this point. Uh, Women's House Serving Gray and Bruce, um, and Huron Shores Hospice. Um, so um, I would, I have a motion, Mr. Mayor, um, but I wanted to, if I could just preface it um, with a couple of comments, um, that uh, the Vice Deputy Mayor, Mike Myatt, who is the Chair of Smart Mobility, um, revealed to council today and staff that um, a, an anticipated increase of our donation to SMART, um, and that increase was $8,788, um, was not going to, in fact, be um, requested by the SMART Mobility Board. Um, and so that then gives us an uh, an amount of $8,788, uh, which has been included, I believe, in our budget at this point. Is that true? That's correct. Okay. And so um, also uh, I had asked uh, the, the treasurer um, about the uh, foreign assurance that uh, the Bruce County levy has been finalized and accounted for in this budget. Um, and that the anticipated increases to our labor negotiations with the engineers and the police association uh, would not make a substantial difference in the projected, our, our tax levy that's been in this proposed budget. Is that true as well? That's correct. Okay, good. Um, so given those things, what I would like to, given those facts, uh, I'd like to make the following motion, and I believe members of council and the mayor have that. Yes, please. Yeah, I have oh. a motion uh, moved by Councillor Gray, second by Councillor Smith. At one, whereas an anticipated increase of $8,788 to the Saugeen Shores contribution to smart mobility is no longer required, and whereas the Saugeen Rail Trail Association, Women's House of Gray and Bruce, and Huron Shores Hospice requested donations during the 2020 budget process that could not be accommodated without an increase to the Saugeen Shores tax levy, <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the following grants and donations be added to the 2020 budget. Uh, and there, those are grants for the Saugeen Rail Trail Association, Women's House of Grand Bruce, and Huron Shores Hospice. And the, the councillor uh, 
hasn't identified the, the dollar values. I, uh, I put a, a clause on the back. So, oh, okay, I see. So, so okay, so, um, so that the, the grants be added for Socking Rail Trail Association, Women's House, Gray and Bruce, here on Shores Hospice. I see, apologies. That the amount to be determined through committee of the whole discussion and decision. So, um, so the resolution is that we would provide grants to those uh, three organizations, but uh, that we would discuss now what level those should be at. Do you have suggestions, Councilor? Uh, well, I, I have some comments sure. that I prepared earlier. Um, so if you let me carry on, I'll, I'll say what I was going to say. Um, with regard to the Rail Trail Association, um, I know firsthand from my membership on the Rail Trail Board uh, between 2014 and 2018, uh, how much work our rail trail volunteers do and what kind of value this brings to our community um, in terms of recreation, economy, um, our tourism. Um, some benefits that are, uh, I mean, there are many, many benefits, but some benefits um, that are provided are ongoing maintenance, weed control, grading, resurfacing, and trail paving, planting new trees uh, every year, um, the um, maintenance of and creation of the Memorial Garden, uh, the gazebo structure there, the River Street Station, um, printing and brochures and trail maps every two years, which are distributed to tourists. Um, the volunteers uh, donate thousands of hours of physical labor and their time um, doing all kinds of, of maintenance work. Um, and um, the organization is facing increasing costs, and I think probably Councillor Schreider and R could add some more specific comments since they now s sit on the board. Um, but um, I wholeheartedly support spending. Um, now they have requested five thousand uh, um, dollars. I guess I'd be interested to hear from Councillors Schreider and Carr. Might give us an update on on what your perception is of, of the use of that, that fi requested 5,000. It's Councillor Carr. Thank you and through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to follow up on Cheryl's comments there, I, I definitely, Chris and I do sit on the board there. Plugging rail trails work very well together this year. I am a new member on it, so I'm still learning as it goes here. Um, but they did step forward and they paved a major section of the trail this year, which they did through fundraising through their own group. That was a $100,000 commitment. Uh, they've also made a, a fairly major capital purchase this year for a trail maintenance groomer, so they've been able to do that in-house with one of the volunteers. I might add with that that they are a member of the organization. Um, so I, I definitely support uh, Cheryl on this one that I would like to see the Sogging Rail Trail get their fi full $5,000 increase for their grant. Um, I think it's a group that's very well put together. They, they have a clear uh, path that they're, they're going for. They have ideas on how they want to extend the trail in the future and how we can make the trail better, you know, potentially out to the Lamont Sports Complex, how we can improve that. So there, there's lots of ways that this group's going to use that money appropriately, in my opinion, with it. So I would definitely support uh, the Sogging Rail Trail, uh, an increase to them, seeing the $5,000 increase, uh, which then I would, uh, my recommendation would be to split over the so that would equal out uh, 5000 to the Sogging Rail Trail and $1,894 to the Women's Shores Hospice and $1,894. Okay, there's a recommendation. Councilor Grace. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, what we'll do is um, what I'd like to get to is to be able to fill out this resolution. It may be difficult because I'm not sure there'll be consensus so anyway but that's what I would like to do so we've heard now uh, on the question of the rail trail in particular a desire to add five thousand dollars in funding uh, for that and we and to split the remainder of this eighty seven hundred eighty eight dollars between the other two um, so that's an option on the table uh, now and we'll hear other comments we'll take council we'll finish with Councillor Grace's comments and then I'll carry on to you Councillor Mayette Councillor Grace thank you um, the, the Women's House, obviously, um, I, I, I'm very proud that we've supported the Women's House through the years the way we have, and I uh, certainly um, agree with Ms. Robinson's comments on its importance. I had some of the same comments down about the, the necessity of having that over 193000 uh, to bridge the gap on uh, 
government funding and operating costs. Um, so this is um, such an important uh, piece of our of our community, and I think we should take the opportunity to provide whatever we can um, in the way of additional funding besides what we've uh, already contributed. And uh, again, for the Huron Shores Hospice, um, having a hospice um, opportunity for our residents. Um, there's one in Owen Sound as well, uh, but uh, it's, I think, 20% of the clientele that use the, the Huron Shores Hospice in Tiverton are from Saugeen Shores, and uh, I would like to see us support that as well. Okay, thank you. Councillor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And, uh, and in, in principle, and through you, in principle, I support the reallocation of these surplus if you like to call it surplus funds. Um, and and I, I sincerely and, and wholeheartedly support two out of the three that are suggested. Um, contributing additional uh, funding to a standalone organization that, uh, that uh, you know, has a, has a volunteer base certainly, but uh, and I'm talking about the Saudi and Realtor Association. I'm not in favor of increasing their funding. When they were here giving their annual presentation, uh, at which time they requested the additional funding, I made a request to them that they would present us with a budget as to how they propose to use those funds and perhaps even how they used the funds in the past. And as of yet, I have not seen a budget presented to this council in that regard. So simply asking for increased funding seems to me um, a little bit premature. As with regards to the other two, uh, the, I, would, I would propose that the ratios be split between the women's house and the hospice, uh, the Huron, yeah, Huron Shores Hospice. Uh, and I would also move that, suggest that there are other deserving charities in this community that have requested funds from this body that are, are being overlooked. Other, uh, one that comes to mind is the uh, TIPS program, the Community Watch and the TIPS program, um, that makes an annual request, and they and they're struggling for funds as well. Um, there, there are lots of organizations, recreational organizations in this community, that don't ask this council for any funds. They raise it all on their own. Uh, the, the Snowmobile Club comes to mind. They're wholly self-funded. The Lake Huron Fishing Club, which operates the Chantry Chinook Classic Derby, and the two hatcheries, one of them in our community, wholly done with raised funds and 100% volunteer work, asks for zero dollars from this body. Yet year after year we get requests from the Saugeen Rail Trail Association for funds. I think it's time the Saugeen Rail Trail Association explores either increased membership dues or uh, some sort of uh, fundraising activities to, to offset their increasing costs and that they shouldn't continue to, to live off the of the uh, taxpayer base when they only really support a, a small segment of the economy. That's my thoughts on this. So unless we can rearrange the numbers, I find myself in a difficult position to not support this motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, what? So one thing that's important to note just at this moment is that staff is working on a policy around, uh, I'm correct about this, right, around donations and our policy, what our policy ought to be for supporting community groups going forward. Uh, one thing I would suggest just uh, at this point is that this should be positioned as a one-time grant to these organizations uh, because we don't may not have this funding in the future and I think we should we should make that stipulation as part of any resolution we put forward so but I did want to clarify that I'm just going to ask uh, is there any is there any agreement with Councillor Mayette's position that uh, we should not provide funding uh, the five thousand dollars funding to the Rail Trail Association. Does anybody wish to support that position, Councillor Rich? Okay, so um, we got to come up with a way to do this, guys, so that we don't we're not here spending over ten thousand bucks all night. So uh, let's just take these one at a time. Can we do that, Councillor Grace? I know that's not exactly your resolution, but I want to take them one at a time so we can just deal with them. Uh, and figure this out. I would so, and I would say too, um, there's no reason to be fixed at $8,788. I tend to make it an even 10, and split this up three ways: give the give the hospice or give the women's shelter the 2,500 they've asked for, 
and and give twenty five hundred to the hospice. I think that that's it's just would be odd to give them eighteen hundred bucks. So let's uh, I, can we do that, Councillor Grace? Can we just make this ten thousand bucks? So we have the request from the Saugeen Rail Trail Association for five thousand uh, dollars. I'm going to ask all in favor of giving five thousand dollars to the Saugeen Rail Trail Association. Opposed. That's carried. Uh, and then, um, and I'm sorry, Councillor uh, Smith, you had your hand up, and I uh, carry, started carrying on with this. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, anyway, so then the second one, Women's House of Great Bruce. Um, I would suggest a $2,500 contribution uh, to the Women's House of Great Bruce. Uh, I don't have a mover and seconder. Does anybody want to move and second that? Moved by Councillor Gray, second by Councillor Smith. All in favor of that? That's carried. And then uh, $2,500 would be my suggestion to the Huron Shores Hospice. Moved by Councillor Smith, second by Councillor Grace. Uh, all in favor? Carried. So, yeah, and and um, and so the balance. So I would like to. I would like us to uh, consider Councillor Grace's resolution uh, with the amendment of the. To, so we take the total in the figure to ten thousand dollars. Which, because we've just approved that, um, and adding to it uh, that the balance of, of so it's eighty seven hundred eighty eight dollars. The balance will be taken from the tax stabilization reserve, and also that these be one time grants. Is there agreement generally? That's been so that and that's a, the, the mover and seconder are okay with those amendments. Does the clerk have those amendments uh, recorded? All in favor of the resolution? Opposed? That's carried. Okay, thank you all. So that takes us back to the main question. Uh, that amends that amends the budget. Um, are there further further discussion with regard to the budget resolution? No, I'd say I'll speak just uh, for myself and on behalf of council. Uh, then uh, thank you so very much to uh, uh, Sue and. Dan and to your uh, team at finance and to the uh, leadership across the municipality who uh, structured this budget uh, and uh, this is a very significant process every year uh, it takes a long time takes a lot of work and I have to say and I've heard from all members or almost all members uh, their um, satisfaction with this year's budget process and their uh, and I think I can speak for all members to say it was extremely well done so uh, thank you uh, very much for uh, making it uh, as painless a process uh, as it can be. So with that, you've heard the recommendation. I'll ask all in favor. That's carried. Okay, that moves us then on to uh, general government and a staff report on the water waterfront revitalization project, future town approvals. Uh, and uh, oh, I would leave, let Councillor Smith go. And the CAO. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mayor. And through you, I'm delighted to speak to this report tonight and clarify its intent for Council. I also appreciate the questions I've received from members of Council so far. Normally, we don't do a report like this. Council approves leases, staff administer them. But in this case, I felt it was prudent to have good clarity, and I know Council has a keen interest in this project. The town has a legal binding contract with the Cedar Crescent Village. Neither party can change the lease without the consent of the other, and staff certainly can't change any element of the lease without council's agreement. The report does not suggest the lease be changed in any way. I'm going to say that again so it's clear. The report does not suggest the lease be changed in any way. Similarly, neither the report nor the lease suggests that the town, either staff or council, circumvent the normal regular approval processes such as a planning committee or committee of adjustment. In fact, the lease says quite the opposite. I made sure that it did. Council approves many leases as a regular course of business. We have private sector leases with doctors, restaurants, snack bars, offices, pro shops, etc. 
and public sector ones with school boards, community groups, curling clubs, etc. Council approves these leases and staff administer them as part of managing the day-to-day -day business. We work within that context on the approved lease and if there are significant variations during the course of the lease, we use our good judgment and if necessary, seek council's direction. It's a routine matter of business. The report tonight is brought to you in that context and recommends two significant approvals remain with council rather than being delegated to staff. Let me speak specifically about the report and address some questions that have been asked. Article 4.3.1 calls for the town approval of the project planning and design arrangements, project plan and development schedule. These are the most critical approvals and staff are recommending council retain them. Subject to the parameters in the lease, council will approve the site design, the building look and the timing of the start of construction. That's what staff have recommended. As the project unfolds after that approval, the report recommends that staff approve routine and changes that do not materially, materially change the project and use our good judgment and alert council to anything beyond that. This is exactly how we manage all other leases and site plan agreements and there has not been any issue with that approach. If a tree needs to move 15 feet during construction, staff will approve that. If the Cedar Crescent Village does not want to operate a tourist tourism office after two years, we would come back to council. This approach works well and keeps projects advancing, minimizing construction disruption to waterfront users and managing costs. It is in everyone's best interest to advance the project now that the lease has been signed. It is how we successfully manage the police headquarters project, bringing it on time and under budget. It is how we are currently managing the breakwater project. Article 4.3.4 .4 of the lease outlines what the town will have regard to when considering the section I just spoke about, 4.3. This article says that the town in the approval shall have regard to the overall quality and character of the project, the integration of the project with the waterfront for the community of Port Elgin as a whole, the impact of the project on parking and other vehicle and pedestrian traffic matters, the suitability of the project for its permitted use, potential violations of any project agreement or any other agreements in existence pertaining to the waterfront for the community of Port Elgin, and the requirements of any other authorities having jurisdiction over the project. The second article, the second item, Article 2.1.1, calls for town approval for what I would say is, and I quote, I put quotes around the site plan agreement, although it is not one, and I put quotes around it because it isn't. Site plan agreements are typically done between the landowners and the town. Since we are both, the language use is slightly different, but the intent is very similar. Once again, staff are recommending that council approve the agreement and staff manage the implementation as we do with our other site plan agreements. These are the two most significant decisions and staff are recommending council retain them. Back to the zoning and bylaws for a moment. Again, staff cannot approve variances to them. Here is a great example. Uh, when I was thinking about this, I thought, well, what's a good example uh, for council? So using the, the recently completed police headquarters, even though it is a municipal building on municipal land, the large police sign did not meet our sign bylaw. Staff went through the committee of adjustment process to garner the required approval. The Cedar Crescent Village project will need to do the same if any relief is required with any of our bylaws or any of our zoning or anything like that. It's not suggested in the report, it's not in the lease, and I certainly wouldn't support uh, any action by staff that, that uh, circumvents that process. In terms of services in lieu as part of the, the lease, council has approved 11 items. These need to be de detailed out as the project advances. Staff will, pro will provide a report to council as the implementation gets closer and it is recommended that minor changes continue to be administered on an ongoing basis with staff. 
The lease calls for a formal check-in on this matter every five years. Staff are recommending that with the two major council approvals identified, staff manage the lease as we do with all other leases, using our good judgment and seek council approvals where appropriate. Thank you. Okay, so we have a recommendation. I'll read it, then we can take questions or comments. It's recommended that Council retain the approval for the site plans and servicing agreement, Article 2.1.1, and that Council retain the initial approval for items listed under Article 4.3.1, and that staff are hereby authorized to approve subsequent revisions to those items approved as part of 4.3.1, provided the modifications are in general conformity with the overall project, and that staff are delegated the authority to approve other items in the lease as outlined in the report using good judgment and seeking council direction for items if deemed necessary. Questions or comments from members of the committee? Councilor Mayat. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And through you, I will be supporting this recommendation. Uh, I think that the way that it's laid out and the way that it has been explained by the CEO, CAO, that, uh, that there are enough checks and balances within the process that when there are significant changes to what has been agreed to through the, the long process that we've been through to come to this level of agreement, that council will be consulted on the major points and the processes that are in place, namely the Committee of Adjustment and the Planning Advisory Committee will be constituted to make those decisions when they come. But to think that council has to get involved in every decision, whether or not the color of the paint or the or the um, the angle of the facade or or the where the services are going to be connected to the site I don't think that's necessarily what we we were elected to do I think that uh, most of the people around this table have other occupations and and as such we have staff that are charged with carrying out the the uh, details of such matters and uh, and I'm confident as has been in the past, that when they reach a point where they require a decision, they will do so with due consideration of everybody's time and bring us together if necessary. So as I re I'll repeat myself that I will support this recommendation. Thank you. Okay, further comments? Councillor Grace. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and this is to the CAO, and uh, I know you did address this, um, the issue of the site plan agreement. Um, this is actually, um, uh, I'm asking this on behalf of the Vice Deputy Mayor who can't be here tonight, but um, he wanted uh, to ask if you would um, provide a little more explanation about the, um, if this particular site plan, or uh, it's not really an agreement, but if you could clarify how it might be different from um, uh, a site plan agreement on a private construction um, project, you know, that we routinely uh, review, um, what might the differences be? Yeah, uh, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, and, and I'll start by saying that uh, a council approves uh, typical site plan approvals. Uh, site plan agreements and council will be approving this modified one. So th I think that's the biggest similarity is that uh, you will be uh, asked to approve this one and, and that's item 2.1.1. So I, I think I'd focus more on, on the similarity of, of that uh, same there. Uh, the, the difference as I outlined in, in my um, opening statement is that uh, typically a site plan agreement is with a, a property owner in the town. So it ensures that the uh, landowner does uh, what we want them to do. In this particular case, we are the landowner. So it's a slightly different uh, uh, document. Uh, Jay Posner is going to be writing it up for us. It will feel very much like a site plan uh, uh, agreement. Um, and it will articulate the things that will require um, the, the Cedar Crescent Village to do to advance the project. So it, it may be may have language about uh, servicing uh, some improvements to the, the um, cul-de-sac, uh, very, very similar to a site plan agreement. And again, council will be approving it. A couple of other things. Um, when I read this report, um, as the CAO knows, I, I did have some questions. Um, and so I asked uh, these questions to the CAO. 
Um, the two areas I was particularly concerned about, um, Schedule C, which lists the um, uh, services in the lease um, in lieu of, of rent. Um, I think that's been a very controversial area. For me, this is one of the most important and I think beneficial parts of this lease is that uh, I believe our municipality is going to be gaining um, many advantages um, through this um, Schedule C in, in providing these services in lieu of rent. I mean, when you think about, for instance, just the construction and operation and ongoing maintenance of an accessible bathroom available year round, and we know how much that costs for us to provide if we are funding that all ourselves. That's just one example, and there, if, you, if the public wants to go back and review what's listed in Schedule C, I think that's uh, an important part. But um, I wonder uh, if, if I could uh, ask the CAO just to, um, to perhaps elaborate on, um, on how that Schedule C, um, those services, would be um, would be monitored and um, what protections are in place in terms of, for the municipality to make sure that that those um, items which are listed in Schedule C those services are going to be actually upheld. Yeah, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks, Councillor Grace, for the questions and and thanks for. Uh, earlier questions. Um, so Schedule C is a very robust list. There's 11 items on it that the proponent has agreed uh, to provide. Uh, there is some detail work that needs to be sorted out as the project advances. An example, I'm looking at the list here. It says a tourist office and staffing, office location for municipal or county tourism initiatives, yearly access to space plus staffing. So, th so th that's uh, what we have agreed on, or the council has agreed on. I just want to re-emphasize that these aren't my agreements. You know, I present them to council. Council makes the decision to do that. Um, so, uh, what still needs to be worked out on that is is what are the hours, what are the days, um, those types of things. And and as the project advances, uh, we'll continue to work with the promote proponent we will flush those out uh, there is a, a report to council that will come uh, later uh, as we get closer to implementing these um, I'll, I'll pick that one as an example let's say we agree that it's going to run from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. And, uh, and, and that's that's the agreement if it, at some point uh, the proponent wants to run it from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. or 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. I, I believe that's something that should be administered through staff uh, if um, the proponent says, hey, I don't want to run a tourism office anymore, that's a significant change and we would bring that to the council. Um, the, the lease also uh, calls for an annual audit, uh, so that's something that, that we will prepare and report back to council on an annual basis, uh, not only Schedule C but other operating standards uh, that, that uh, uh, the proponent has uh, uh, agreed to. Uh, so we'll be doing that on an annual basis, again, not just for Schedule C, but for operating standards, because we have very high operating standards. And then the, uh, uh, as well in the lease, there is a, an agreement that every five years we will do a more formal check-in on Schedule C uh, to update it. Um, if the uh, proponent builds a, a skating rink, um, and, and that's done for lieu of services, we can't take it away the next year and say too bad. Um, so he's got, uh, they've got assurances that at least they're they're working in five year windows. Um, so one of the other areas that I was um, particularly concerned about was Article Six Point One, um, which is on the issue of permitted uses, and uh, so that would be. Um, in the lease, it talks about, for instance, uh, certain allowable commercial businesses like uh, restaurant, banquet hall. Um, and I wondered about the definition of a restaurant um, under the lease, and if, if you could elaborate on, on what the lease's interpretation of that would be and what would be examples of 
of commercial businesses that would not be permitted in this development. Thank you very much for the question. Through you, Mr. Mayor, sometimes I think people forget that, that there, are, there is zoning. Uh, there's restrictions on, on what the uh, Cedar Crescent Village can do in regards to zoning. I've heard, that, you know, early on there was going to be a shopping mall down there. You know, I had a member of the community write me a, an impassioned letter that we shouldn't put a shopping mall down there. Well, a shopping mall doesn't meet uh, the, the zoning for the area. So a, any uh, a significant retail uh, commercial is, is uh, uh, not allowed. Uh, any retail needs to be connected to, to the waterfront and, and so you couldn't open a shoe store as an example, uh, but you could do a, a harbor tuck shop, you know, that, that's related to the area. There is a zoning, a, a zoning overlay uh, that restricts it. Um, we've, as you, you'll remember during our initial stages, we consulted with, with uh, professional planners and, and gave us their, their context. Uh, a restaurant, um, uh, through negotiations with our contract lawyer, a, a restaurant is a very open. Uh, anything related to, to food services, quite frankly, if uh, uh, an ice cream shop or a coffee shop would fit the, the um, definition of a of a restaurant, and um, I'll stop there. Unless did I answer your question yes. sufficiently? Yeah. The, the other thing, and, and Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks for the reminder. Um, the, the other control that, that uh, the, the uh, town has is the built form. <laughs> so I've got the, I don't know if you saw that. Is, is uh, the, the built form. So, you know, the uh, council is going to approve what, what's being built there. Um, let's say there, there's a coffee shop and an ice cream shop ne next door to each other. Uh, uh, two years from now, um, Cedar Crescent Village wants to add something new. Uh, they, they can't add new buildings, um, and they can't renovate uh, their existing buildings with a council's approval. So they couldn't tear that down and, and create something else. Um, so th there's a lot of um, controls built into this on purpose. Staff have worked really hard. We've used the, the, the uh, uh, experts that we've talked about to make sure there's lots of protection. Uh, Council's been very supportive of, of the project, and, and I, I think uh, there, there's uh, sufficient checks and balances in, in there. Further questions? Councillor Schreider. Uh, thank you, and through you. Um, definitely very supportive of the project throughout, um, and, uh, and I struggled a little bit with this one. And uh, when I read it this weekend and uh, reviewed some of the questions that were asked and, and listening to David's uh, presentation uh, today, it, it does help to clarify a few things. Um, and I don't mean this to, uh, to come across as, as micromanagement or, or a lack of trust in staff because that definitely isn't, uh, isn't the case with me at all. Um, but I believe that um, that the CCV uh, development is one that would have many potential changes or revisions during the construction phase and possibly uh, with the lease agreement um, after the business opens. Um, and I think that this project council is extremely invested in and uh, speaking for myself, I want to be involved in, in past just the approval stage as well uh, for this project. Um, I, I believe that council would still have an active role uh, with this development and, and as I listen to, to your um, presentation tonight, I almost separate the two of them between the construction phase of things and then the, the management of the lease. Um, and I know it's it's intertwined in here. Um, was there ever any, I guess a question would be, is, was there any thought given to or, or contemplation with regards to a, an ad hoc committee for the construction phase of the development and if, um, and, and perhaps members of council sitting on that? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, the, there was not. Um, uh, the, we have uh, negotiated a, a, a role of, of a staff person uh, sitting on, on the private construction uh, project. It is a, a private construction project, uh, and, and we're uh, uh, delighted we were able to have a staff person at, at the table there. Um, the construction projects move very quickly. Uh, as you know, once they get going, you know, they're meeting weekly. Uh, they're, they're doing things. Uh, there's some terminology in, in the lease. Um, and and I, I, again, I, I would equate it to the police building where, where council, you know, very vested interest. You know, the, it's uh, very important. Uh, we uh, brought the, the, the project uh, to council, showed the design, showed the things, and, and um, Council approved it and, and staff managed that. So that, that's our, our, our thought this way. Um, 
if there's something significant, Councillor, we would definitely bring it back. Um, there is something in, in the lease, uh, I think it's called modifications, and, and uh, we have a, a 10 days. If there's anything significant, uh, we would bring it back to Council, and, and the proponent has agreed to uh, delay the project 10 days uh, to give Council that time to, to uh, make the decision if required. So uh, through you and just the clarification on that last one and, and that's a clause that I think helps me be comfortable uh, more comfortable with this would be that if there was uh, and I know understand the importance of not delaying especially with a critical project like that and timelines means everything um, delays in construction is, is very expensive and, and has a lot of impact um, if if a substantial decision had to come forth to council uh, for approval and, and whatever that example would be um, and our a council meeting didn't occur within that 10 days, how would we manage that? Uh, if, as in any case, uh, if there's a situation arises where the administration needs council's opinion or instruction, I will call a, a, a meeting of council uh, and council will uh, deal with that issue. Um, that's how it would be dealt with. I, okay, um, further comments? Okay, I don't see any. Uh, so you've heard the recommendation. Um, and uh, just, I guess, just before I call the question, I just wanted to make one comment because it's a thing that's uh, important to me, I think, to say uh, is that um, just this uh, sort of, uh, um, it's related to this, but more than this, I wanted to state that I just have a tremendous amount of confidence in municipal staff to administer all of our leases as Councillor Schreider rightly pointed out. I think that that's a view that's shared by all members of council. I have particular confidence and I want to make this absolutely clear in David Smith and his ability to uh, manage this file. He's managed it extremely well on our behalf uh, and, uh, and he's done that in the interest of the municipality uh, in my assessment uh, and, uh, and so I think uh, um, I wanted to make that comment uh, because I think that he's done an outstanding job uh, all around whatever council chooses to do with this resolution or any other. So, you've heard the recommendation. All in favor? Opposed? That's carried. So, that then, well, we'll wait, pardon me, for Councillor Smith. This moves us on to, oh, sorry, All right. that's me, sorry, Matt. That moves us on to communications and petitions of the, petitions for committee of the whole information. There's two items there. Are there any comments on either of those? Uh, Councillor Rich. Yeah, through you, <clears throat> through you, Mr. Mayor, um, I'd like to speak to um, the uh, Basra 2020 budget. I am like to council to make note that uh, we took $220,000 from uh, capital reserves um, at this point um, because of loss in commodity revenue um, from plastics and aluminum and then uh, lack of market for newspaper and paper products. So um, that uh, turns out to be a 13.5% uh, increase plus a $220,000 um, pull from reserves. Um, the future doesn't look any brighter. Um, we could have very easily taken a 40% uh, increase this year. Um, there was a difference of opinion at the table that day uh, because there's $2 million in reserves currently with Basra and uh, there will be stewardship changes down the line which could change processing and the amount of equipment that we need to provide. Um, it is estimated that we we'll, could use somewhere in the vicinity of about $2 million worth of additional equipment or um, changes to the facility out there. And if we continue to deplete reserves, then we will have to go back to um, all the uh, uh, partner municipalities and, and get that money somewhere. So um, I think that it's worth mentioning at this point uh, that we can expect a, a probably another 13.5% increase next year, additional um, to thousand dollars loss um, from the capital reserves thank you councillor I think it's uh, unfortunate that uh, Basra is uh, choosing to deplete its reserves uh, with regard as to uh, fund these uh, operating deficits um, it's a cost 
I don't like paying it. I'm sure our taxpayers don't like paying it any more than I do. Uh, but um, but we need to have capital reserves in Basra. We've seen with SMART, for example, how a lack of capital reserves can cause a, uh, one of our uh, municipal organizations to suffer and, and run the risk of failure. We can't have Basra fail. Uh, so in my view, uh, it's uh, a mistake for Basra to deplete its reserves annually to fund these operating deficits. And I know that that's a message that, uh, that uh, you will deliver also to the Basra board. Any further uh, comments? Okay, then, uh, then that moves us on to reports of department heads uh, and uh, an information report on the concession six employment lands. And we'll just wait a sec for the council. So we don't have any, all right, well, councilor leave and we'll see if there's any questions. So it's there uh, for information. I guess that staff isn't going to read it. Are there questions uh, with regard to the report? Uh, councilor Mayette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and through you. Um, I'm, I'm excited about the, the concept of, uh, of developing that land into the next phase of the industrial park, I guess, because our, our current industrial park adjacent to this facility is, is reaching, if not has reached its capacity. Um, and you mentioned in the report 30 acres, but the whole property is, encompasses 160 acres, and I know uh, there's another 30 or so that is going to be that is the site of the future Lamont Sports Complex, and there's a, a big section that uh, borders uh, between the creek and Concession 6, which is currently in agricultural use. And, uh, and I was approached by, uh, I, I know the current person who, the current uh, agricultural producer that uses that land, and uh, I was wondering if, if that arrangement is scheduled to continue, and uh, if it is, the intent is to keep that land in agricultural use for at least the foreseeable future, uh, is it uh, been contemplated that it would be opened up to tender for other members of our community that may want to bid on use of that land? Through you, Mr. Mayor, thanks for the question. So we, right now, we won't be changing the, the use of it. Um, certainly as we advance the project, when we move into the planning and the zoning, that's part of the RFP that's just been posted to talk about highest and best use on that piece of property. Um, and you're correct, the 30 acres um, is the one parcel of, of land and it's 30 acres based that is actually developable. So that excludes some of the EP around it and where we're unable to develop. So we won't be touching the land until we're ready and we have a concept and we have council's approval to advance um, with designing the business park, so to speak, that works best for our economy at this time. The CAO just wanted to make a comment. Oh, okay. I'd just like to comment and, and uh, what Jessica said is, is absolutely right. If you're asking specifically our agreement with the current tenant, we have an agreement with the current tenant. Uh, uh, he does not pay rent, and the reason why he does not pay rent is because uh, we reserve the right to go in and, and access the, and use the property at any time. So he could be three quarters of the way through a, a growing season and uh, lose that, but that's an agreement that we have. Certainly, we would be sympathetic and try and time it and and do all of the the good things to, to um, uh, keep him. Um, I, I agree that we should try and make sure that he, along with everybody else in our agricultural community, remains successful. But uh, I have been approached by a, a couple of other people in the agricultural business that have expressed an interest in maybe renting that land. So maybe with those terms in mind, uh, there are, could be other potential interested customers, and we should probably, being that that's public land, consider putting an, an RFP or a tender out there to see if anybody else wants to bid on renting that land. It's just, it seems like an appropriate use of public land to me. Okay, further uh, questions about this information report? Well, thank you very much uh, to the director for the update. So we can bring back uh, Councillor Carr. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the Committee of the Whole Agenda and uh, announcements by members. The Deputy Mayor. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, two notes that I'd like to pass along. Our hockey season in town is winding down. The Winter Hawks have been put out. But we do have the Pee Wee Bees who will be advancing to the OMHA semifinals against um, geez, Perry Sound. And we're just waiting on the coin toss for that. And on a sadder note, uh, we, I'd just like to mention the passing of, of one of our longtime um, business people in town, Dr. Larry Carr, passed away on Sunday and funeral arrangements will be coming up very shortly. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Smith. Uh, yes, a sh shameless self-promotion uh, in celebration of International Women's Day, the Saugeen Shores Chamber of Commerce is hosting an event at the Walker House, uh, the Brave Bold Breakfast, of which uh, myself and other members of the community will be speaking at. It's marketed as an off-the-cuff conversation about women in our community. Um, this corresponds with the Shore Report podcast that I recorded last week and will be airing this week uh, that speaks about International Women's Day and its impact on uh, this organization and in particular the elected officials, the female elected officials who've come before us that paved the way for, uh, for us to have 33% female representation at this table. Thank you. Great, thank you. Councillor Schreider, nothing. Councillor Grace. Um. I just wanted to uh, remind the public about um, two upcoming um, workshops uh, this week. One is in Concordon tomorrow night at the Davidson Center, and the other is at the Bruce County Museum in Southampton. They're both from 6.30 to 9 o'clock. Uh, the workshops are sponsored by, um, co-sponsored by the Saugeen Valley Conservation Authority and the Lake Huron Coastal Conservation Center. And it is called um, Protecting Coastline and Coastal Processes from Erosion. Um, and it is called the Lake Huron Nearshore Workshop. So I would encourage people, members of the public and uh, others who are interested in uh, those, they're both the same workshop, but I'm sure they'll be valuable. Both the SBCA and Lake Huron Coastal Conservation Center put on excellent uh, programs. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Rich. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and um, I'd just like to echo uh, um, Deputy Mayor Matheson's uh, comments uh, wishing the PWB team uh, good luck against uh, Perry Sound and um, uh, Concordon good luck in the, in the Adam round. They beat us out yesterday. So. Um, I don't know if there's any good reason to wish King Garden good luck. <laughs> Councillor Mayette, Councillor Carr, uh, I just wanted to, a uh, couple quick things. First, uh, today I uh, met with officials from uh, I and, uh, and um, the CAO, met with officials from Blue Water District School Board. Uh, I had an excellent meeting and, uh, and there'll be more to report out over time over that. And I won't get into the details, but I did just want to uh, express at this point my appreciation to those officials for taking the time to come here and meet with us. And uh, we have a very positive and proactive uh, relationship with the Blue Water District School Board. Uh, that isn't uh, always the case between municipalities and school boards. Uh, and so I think it's worth just sort of um, expressing uh, how, how good a relationship we have. And I think that's going to work the way I see it. That's going to work out well for the people of Saugeen Shores going forward in terms of uh, space for uh, education in our community. Uh, and uh, oh, and the one, other, the one other thing was I was at the business after hours. Uh, Councillor Mayette was there too on Thursday. And I just wanted to say thank you to the Chamber of Commerce because they were uh, raising money as part of that for the Rainbow uh, Crosswalk project, which we've just approved funding for uh, earlier this evening. Uh, so, uh, so it was really a positive thing for them to do, and I just wanted to tell them, say how much I appreciated it. So, with that, we'll take a motion to adjourn. Moved by the deputy mayor, seconded by Councillor Rich. All in favor? We stand adjourned until 20 after. <laughs> <laughs>